a Free Media Productions audio commentary. This is Billy Anitzi with Free Media Productions. The ideas commonly espoused by revisionist Trotsky elements attempting to discredit the contributions of Stalin in the realm of Marxism-Leninism, both in terms of thought and practical outcome, are hardly relevant in any real overt sense. Trotskyism itself, along with the Fourth International, have devolved into obscurity and are hardly worth the time and effort of adequate rebuttal. Nonetheless, as a matter of principle, it's important to maintain every effort to renounce revision of Trotskyism wherever it shows itself and to correct the slanderous commentaries arising from its minuscule adherence. Though Trotskyism today has no political relevance anywhere in the world, it's certainly worth mentioning the historical concept of Trotskyism as counter-revolutionary oppositionism. The idea that Trotskyism existed as a concurrent alternative to Stalin's Marxist-Leninist line is laughable. It was not Stalin who removed Trotsky from the top organs of power within the Bolshevik Party and Soviet state, but the entire organization of the Central Committee that saw him as a dangerous element incapable of directing the revolution any further and thus sustaining the Soviet Union's establishment of socialism. This brings into question Trotsky's so-called permanent revolution, which in and of itself was inherently anti-Marxist-Leninist, for it failed to take into consideration the material conditions facing the Soviet Union at the time. Though I'm sure Western Trotskyites, in all their wisdom of conditions facing Russia and the constituent republics at the time, will undoubtedly disagree, had the Soviets instead pursued Trotsky's policy of permanent revolution without promoting socialism in one country, as Stalin had correctly proposed, then it is without a doubt that the existence of the Soviet Union would have come under serious pressure in the years following Lenin's death, and almost certainly would not have yielded the industrialization needed to thwart the German invasion of 1941. Thus, the political ramifications of a Trotskyite line in the Soviet Union would have led to the unnecessary obstacles in the development of Soviet socialism at best and the destruction of the Soviet proletarian state at worst. Stalin's line was correct in its realistic understandings of the mere material conditions that existed at the time in accordance with the economic and political developments that were to later be initiated in Stalin's first and consecutive five-year plans. Other objections to Stalin are merely peripheral or insignificant. Lenin's infamous testament calling for the alleged removal of Stalin is another favorite point of opportunistic Trotskyites to further disseminate the idea that Stalin was unfit and undesirable to continue to lead the party at the time. However, if one actually reads Lenin's testament, it criticizes Stalin on the basis of his being rude, which undoubtedly was greatly influenced by Stalin's comparatively harmless confrontation with Lenin's wife and the debilitating effects of Lenin's poor help. Nonetheless, it should also be noted that Lenin did not call for Stalin to be entirely removed from power, but rather raised the issue of possibly removing him as general secretary of the Bolshevik party. And it also should be noted that Stalin at this time offered his resignation as general secretary, which the Central Committee promptly denied. On the other hand, leaders like Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Gominev fared far worse in Lenin's assessment for their potential for leadership. It was they who took the leading initiative in suppressing Lenin's testament, as his criticisms of the left opposition had been far more damning than those of Stalin and his supporters. On the issue of opportunism within opposition movements, even today, the Trotskyite revisionists confine themselves to discrediting the contributions of Stalin at the expense of the international proletarian movement with their rotten liberalism, disinformation, and sectarianism. This was the case in the Soviet Union, but at a much greater level. The political dynamic within the party presented by the opposition movement, whether intentional or otherwise, led to a direct attack on party unity and in essence was in dire contradiction to the principles of democratic centralism. And let us not forget that when Trotsky was in the majority, he called for strict adherence to the party line, yet when in the minority, he called for more inter-party democracy. As has been known since its inception, Trotskyism as a form of deviant oppositionism, its true nature unfolds as a mere political obje objection to the supremacy of the Stalin-Marxist-Leninist line, rather than a sincere matter of serious ideological question. 